thing as things coming on the scene that had never been done before. We don't want to face that. The racists in 1960s said, you know what? The white or the black people out here burning up the cities and demonstrating every day. We can't get nothing done. Everything is off course. Say so now they're talking about studying their history. We will watch that. It scared them at first. But when they found out that what we were studying history for, they relaxed. Because we were studying history in order to do what? Feel good. Feel good. You got it. That's why we started studying history. Once they figured out that's what we were going to do with it, they helped us. They say, oh, you know, you want your picture on the wall? You want, you want a picture of Timbuktu? Oh, I'll cover the wall with pictures of Timbuktu. Uh, 1500, you know, 1,500 years ago. You know, what else do you need? Right. You want to feel good. Okay, you want to clap your hands? Bring on some tom-toms, you know, some kettle drums and whatnot. Hey, you know, y'all want to beat drums? Beat on them, you know. Just don't beat on me, you know. Right. See, so they said we want to take this trip and go on a feel-good trip. Rather than do what? What is the purpose for studying history? To learn. To learn and to learn what? And to learn, wait a minute, let's take it step by step. To learn what happened in order to do what? Not repeat mistakes. Okay? Our foreparents, out of all due regard for them, and I got them, you know. I admired my father and mother and grandfather and the grandmother. They did the best they could, but it still wasn't good enough. That's right. Why? And that's the truth. See, we got to face that truth. They might have known a whole bunch of stuff, okay? But when they came up against this, they had no idea of what to do. Mm-hmm. And proof of it is we are here in 2003 in this room right now on George Avenue in what some people say is the capital of the world. Trying to figure out what to do about a mess that got started a long time ago. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Thousands of books being written. Because somebody made mistakes. Somebody encountered some white supremacist who was black and didn't know what they were doing and how they were doing it. That's why I put in the book, they're the most familiar mystery in the world. They're familiar in that we are looking at them all the time. We are looking, we pass white people all day on the street. We work next to them. We're in the motel beds with them on Sunday morning. And don't know nothing about them. Where is the proof? Because why is it that they run everything and we don't run nothing? And we're looking right at them. And can't figure them out. Okay. <laughs> They are the biggest mystery in the world. We always talk about things mysterious and, you know, Harry Potter and the Wizard and all this. Breakdown Friday, Joseph Ward, Professor Carl Tone Jones, Patrick Irvin. We breaking down Neely Fuller and Amos Wilson. We just dealing with the Neely Fuller part right now. And so start off talking about feel good black history. That's that was being taught and that is being taught. Feel good black history, along with the lack of understanding of the utilization of the information that's being given to us and that's still got us to where we are now where we're still complaining about racism we haven't really had any any true progress any tangible progress but we do want these things we want the progress we want to end racism we want the system of justice to happen but we're stuck in a place to where we just need to feel good we have a uh, we're addicted to feeling good. I just say that we have an addiction to feeling good, using the information to make ourselves feel good and to make others feel good. And it's kind of like, you know, we talk about it all the time. How um, in certain circles that we've seen, where people who have chosen to leave Christianity get into these non-Christian circles, and the the atmosphere is still Christian. Like it's still like they're in the church because the speaker's up in front of everybody and they're speaking, they're hooping and hollering and everybody. Yes. I, and they just, they just switching the amen with our shades. Right. Cause we, let's be real. We all know, we all seen it. They switched the amens with our shades and everything that they would say in the church. They just, they, they're 
expressing themselves the same way, just using different wording. So this is what Neely Fuller is getting into, and Amos Wilson's Wilson's piece is going to support it as well. But uh, go to you first, PC, because I like that shirt. That's a smooth <laughs> shirt. You know, so what are your, what are your thoughts on what uh, Amos Wilson is talking about? So, uh, <laughs> you know, it kind of takes me back to uh, do the right thing. And the scene where, you know, which was a repetitive scene is um, when a brother came in and he kept asking, yo, Sal, why isn't there any brothers on the wall? You know what I'm saying? Uh, that conversation about being representative, you know, representation. We just want to see the tape. You know, um, we have created well, not we, they, they have created a God complex, a Messiah complex, in which they taught black people that their God is white and that because their God is blonde hair, blue eyes, that um, you know, black people associate God being next to godliness with being next to whites. And so uh, you know, that that's part of it. There's another part of it too, though, and I think you know, uh, you might have to bleep this out, but I think ass whoopings led to assimilation. You know, mm -hmm. the desire to be assimilated. Um, and it started with the buck breaking on the plantations. It started with the, you know, um, the changing, the, the removal of power and the likeness of black skin. And so a lot of black folk nowadays, especially, um, and I think we talked about it a little bit last week, but... Um, I think that we've been trained and trained very well to want to be considered or want proximity to whites. Uh, there was a time when the uh, when when post Reconstruction, when black folk were out there building their own towns, and black people were really coming up and creating their own financial and economic power. Um, Structure that um, the social engineers of that time, which were you know Rockefellers, all the blue blood families, determined that they had to fix the black problem. And the way they the, the way they created the narrative was that we set black people free from slavery. We have we've emancipated black folk from slavery, but we didn't give them any skills, so they're out here illiterate and this, that, and the other, which is the furthest thing from the truth. Black people from slavery went from less than 5% of the population being literate to over 50% of the population being literate by the year 1900. So that was factually inaccurate. Black people were building up their own epicenters throughout the world. I mean, we all talk about the Black Wall Street, but let's be real. There were dozens of black Wall Streets um, that black people had built up. So they created these institutions. And Rockefeller is famous for having this train ride down the I-95 corridor in which he came up with this brilliant plan to become philanthropist. And along with other blue blood families, uh, they started creating these land grant institutions, these HBCUs. And that's why these HBCUs all have white they're all named after white benefactors. Even the ones here in Philadelphia, Lincoln University and Cheney University, white benefactors. So when you have that institution, you're able to train and retrain black folk to think like white people. And then even up until a decade ago, Howard University was still punishing students for having locks and braids in their hair. You know, um, because they had preparatory uh, preparation or preparatory classes that their students had to take on in order to go into the workforce, not build or create their own, but go into the workforce and assimilate further. And so the academia, the academics and things of that nature, creating a talented 10th and things of that nature. When you create all those different things, that's who black folk look up to. Black folk look up to those who best emulate white practices, white excellence. Black folk looked up to that. And so um, we didn't learn from the history. Dr. Carter G. Woodson put out 
The Miseducation of the Negro, one of several books that he wrote. In that book, he said that if we don't regain control of the academics of black people so that it benefits black people, we'll just create a legacy of black skinned white supremacists who will teach black people, black folk to go to the back doors of buildings. And if there's not a back door to the building, then they black will folk build will build one. one. Right. So you have all these different things going to place. And best believe those Negroes, they saw what happened to the black people who actually put up some resistance. They saw what happened to the political, the ones that became political prisoners. They saw the police sanctioned and state sanctioned um, hits and assassinations carried out on uh, Martin Luther King. Um, at the time, they thought Malcolm X, it was strictly the nation of Islam. We now know that the FBI and the CIA uh, played a great deal, uh, a large part in the assassination of, Mark, of, of Malcolm X. And so it was safer to be an activist than it was to be a revolutionary. And therefore, if I'm an academic, I can punch down on other black folk and utilize, use my intellectual uh, skills, my, my, my oration um, and knowledge of history to pretty much dress down any brothers and sisters who might be interested in changing the said circumstances of black people today. And I land up. So you saying like Halle Berry and Monsters Ball, we just want to feel good. We just want somebody to make us feel good. Yeah. And um, <laughs> just intellectual <laughs> masturbation is what makes us feel good. I mean, you think about it. Uh, you look at social media on a daily basis. You got people saying happy birthday to cats that have been dead for you. You got people saying, you, people uh, reaching out and trying to impress other people with their knowledge of history. But when you look at the people that actually led revolutions or rebelled in the past, like the Nat Turner, then Mark Vesey, and you look at the people that they were lining up against, those people didn't have a real background historically about what was going on. Most of their background was spiritual. Most of them were basically saying, spiritually speaking, we're ordained by God to fight for our freedom. We're ordained by God to rebel against this enemy, this evil oppression. You know, most of them didn't even pick, they, they, they could barely read. Um, you look point. at the Haitian Revolution. You think they were out there reading history books? You know, back in Timbuktu, we did this, the Nile Valley Civilization, you know, but da 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 da. No, they knew the spiritual history, but they didn't know, you know, they, they weren't out there, you know, trying to publish a book. It wasn't nobody out there screenshotting or going Facebook live during their liberation struggles. We got that type of stuff going on today. And then most of these Negroes just want to be famous enough to be in a history book themselves. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, all right. Pat, get in here and I'm give my thoughts. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, no, I, I agree with PC. Uh, I believe it was H.T. Keeler wrote a um, in a composite book that was released in 1898 um, called The Negro Problem. It was a composite book, a composite of various um, lectures, or I'm sorry, short writings and essays and stuff from various uh, prominent speakers and academics and things of that nature at a time. Um, I believe W.B. Du Bois had an article in there and Booker T. Washington had an a, 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 a art, article in there, um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. But in any case, I always find the part by H.T. Keeling interesting because uh, this is in 1898 and it was the earliest book that I had read where somebody had gone through and tried to chronicleize or tried to identify the um, the inborn traits of black people as a race and the inbred traits that black people in America had picked up um, due to our circumstances. And what's really interesting about that is you know the traits that he selected one of the traits that always goes back to when he talks about the inborn traits he 
he talks about uh, how black people all over are cheerful, right? And then he talks about how black people all over, regardless of circumstances, are affectionate and show a lack of vindictiveness, right? Like as our natural state of being as black people. Um, and then, of course, you know, you look at the way we treat each other and that's addressed, too, when he gets into the inbred traits. But one of the most interesting parts of that is when you combine all those things together, you get somebody that just want to feel good. They just want to move through life, smiling, happy, live well and die. Right. And we're not in an environment now where that's conducive to what we need to do. Um, and this goes back to what we what, what you know, some of the things I said last week, where it's like at some point, uh, elders have got to break the mold and start challenging the younger generations to be different, to do different and to add uh, to the story, add to the narrative. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest challenges we have now is that we don't really know. And I agree with like what he said, uh, we don't utilize history properly. A lot right. of us don't know what to do with history. Right. Like that's because historically history has been used. And this goes all the way back. It's been used by the common person to make them feel better. Yep. We overcame. We did this. We're a powerful. There's been a select group of people that understand that they can utilize history to change, make changes in the present that will create a new future. But there's been a disconnect. Yeah, there's been a disconnect between the advocates, the activists, and the historians. Um, and that's largely been powered by the fact that nobody's been groomed to know what to do with history. So we, 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 um, I mean, you, the, the conversation was about not being able, not utilizing history for what we need. To do. Right. Um, and I think you were going to get it. You, you were getting more into, you know, the errors of the, of our elders and not holding us accountable for doing something different than they did. Um, and I totally agree with that because something needs to change. You know, uh, studying this, and then when you look at the people studying it, right? And I don't even hold, I hold myself accountable too. Like we need to be in better shape because we're studying, but we ain't putting ourselves in position to fight for things we're studying for. Um, most of us, you guys are in terrific shape. I, I need to catch up. But uh, when you think about the, like you said, the feel good notion. They have literally conditioned black folk, and I say they, white folk, have conditioned us to, um, to to be happy. This, the singing Negro, like they literally created, uh, their a lot of their programming around that. A lot of their, uh, um, uh, what, what was it? What was it? The the minstrel shows were based on the happy Negro on the plantation. Um, they took things that we utilized that that were. But we were actually using this uh, tool, tools in our toolkits and our weaponry, such as singing the Negro spiritual, and turned it into the Happy Negro moment. Because the Negro yeah. spiritual literally was was us using the uh, the words to plant to, to to pass on secret messages to each other. But they took it, and now I, I mean I, I watched something a few years ago a show, and it and it was uh, like one of those uh, DC comic shows. And they were going from different times in, in history. And they ended up on a plantation. And black folk were being mistreated, killed, and lynched in the, in, in the show. And then they just showed the resilient spirit of black people by having these Negroes start singing. And I started getting pissed off because I'm like, Wait, singing, you can get your ass whooped. No, you know, that's singing? <laughs> like the magical Negroes. No, that's actually like a... a a character trope in Hollywood, like the mm -hmm. magical Negro, but but it's like so. Like I was was trying to say, <laughs> the <laughs> I'm sorry, it wasn't coming out right. But the the lack of the utilization of history. So I think about the story of Sandiata and how the Kingdom of Mali um, was was founded. So Sandiata had a uh, his jelly, 
is griot. They use the word griot, but his jelly. Uh, I can't. I just forgot his name, but he had the jelly with him. So the jelly's purpose was to know the history, to be able to teach it to the king. And the king's job was to utilize the history to expand the empire and expand his people and make things better for his people and his empire, right? So Sandiata literally utilized the historical information that he was given to help found the empire of Mali. Now, we get to where we are now. We have so much history to learn from of what worked and what didn't work but we are stuck in this mode of the intellectual masturbation i need to feel good it's the it's like if i know more history than the next then i'm a better person it's the elitism of it it's the it's the separation it makes me feel good we're we are relegated to only feeling good we're relegated to only expressing ourselves artistically because that makes us feel good like you said pc you're going through, we've all seen it in the movies. You're going through this tough time and you got to sing it out. Swing low. We shall overcome. It's something about the song. It's something about the song that just empowers us to make that, that charges us up. Like if we were superheroes, once again, we were superheroes. The way we the way we activate our powers is through song. And then now we can tell off the whole world because that's our superpower to tell off people. Right. But hey, 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 it's not working. It's not. I think you, you I'm, you're trying to feel good. It's not really making us feel good. But I think that we're in a doubly negative space, as I remember now, because what you just said triggered it. Because we also exist in a society where people don't know what to do with history. Uh, like when we talk about like American society as a whole, right? The, 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 I mean, we're seeing it right now in, in counseling and therapeutic practices where uh, the, the, the dominant therapeutic practices nowadays are therapeutic practices that are solutions based in present time focus. They are advising young counselors to, to not focus on past events of past traumas. And that speaks to a lack of understanding about how the his, about how the past creates the present. One thing we could do right now, and Neely Fuller said it, one thing we could do right now is use history and all of the information that we have to learn our enemies, learn everything we need to know about white people and how we move so we won't keep making the same mistakes. And basically, becoming a part of everything they have because we feel like what they have is better because we don't spend time learning and he said <laughs> they're right next to us they're they're incorporated into every aspect of our lives and we still don't know them and understand them we don't that's one thing we could do with the history is learn our enemies you could do that immediately <laughs> 